Good evening. Welcome, everybody. I am glad you're here. I know this room is a bit hard to find, especially if you're new to campus. Um, I'm Dr. Ganesh, if you don't know me. I was the crazy person emailing all of you. I hope you only got one message from me rather than two messages. Some people got two messages. Right, yeah, that was a computer glitch. Hopefully that won't be repeated. <laughs> um, thank you for coming. Uh, today is our first Engineering Futures Seminar for the fall season, and we are going to do this every first Thursday of the month. September, October, November, February, March, and April. And the pattern will go on for as long as we can continue doing it. And the next speaker is Ryan Parker, who's head of Responsive Retail, Internet of Things division in Intel. And you will find out what all of that means when you meet him. And the third speaker is actually a, um, whose son graduated from the aviation program. It's Dave McKay, who is um, in Virgin Atlantic. Virgin Galactic. So we're trying to bring in different types of people who have very unique journeys that made them who they are today. So our speaker today is Mark Wallace, who is the Senior Vice President, Global Engineering and Sustainability at UPS. You might think, what does UPS have to do with engineering? Right. All we know about UPS is they deliver packages. Well, you will be surprised. How much engineering is actually in to what goes behind your package showing up at your doorstep? and all the innovative technologies that UPS is investigating and looking into. So they not only hire industrial engineers, they also hire mechanical engineers and electrical engineers and other, other specific majors. So Mark's journey is very interesting. So I won't give his story away because we want him to share how he became who he is today with you. And there will be a period of time where you can ask questions. And um, you, this is your opportunity to get to know somebody who's really grown in their company to become a top leader in the industry. So just a little bit about Mark, and then I will let him tell his, tell his passionate story about how he became this wonderful leader. Mark is responsible for the optimized and efficient operations of the company's facilities, drivers, package flow technologies. Any industrial engineers in the room? Okay, good. So you should recognize some of these terms. Others will, soon. He's also responsible for driving UPS's broad spectrum of industry-leading sustainability programs and initiatives in the 220 countries and territories it serves. And without giving away too much, he actually made his way up by starting his journey in Arizona, where he was going to school for his bachelor's degree in industrial engineering by becoming a driver for UPS. And then went through various engineering programs, has a lot of experience working with people, working with technologies, and working with different cultures. If you're in my classes, you will hear about how global engineering is. His story is going to reflect that. So welcome, Mark. Okay, good evening, everybody. Now, I'm going to warn everybody before I really even start my uh, um, talk this evening, because I want you to think as I kind of go through my just journey at UPS, my journey here at ASU, um, but I want you to think about questions, okay? Because if you don't ask questions at the end of this discussion, guess what? I get to ask questions of you. So it's very important that you, you take that very seriously at the beginning of this tonight because I do want this to be interactive um, and I really look forward to, uh, to being here tonight because, you know, for me, um, being an ASU graduate, uh, it certainly is a privilege and an honor to stand in front of a group of engineering students um, and a group, and I know not everybody is engineering, but you're all within the engineering college here at UPS, here at ASU. 
See, they go hand in hand, ASU and UPS. It's going to happen to me more than once tonight, so you can correct me if that's, uh, if that's okay. Um, as Ganesh said, I am the senior vice president of our global engineering group at UPS and our sustainability programs at UPS. And if I kind of reflect back uh, on my history, um, I really actually started in a small northern Minnesota college, going to college, and I talked to a couple students in here tonight already, um, in northern Minnesota. The college was 2,500 students, 2,500, probably smaller than some of the high schools many of you actually attended in this room. Um, I ended up coming down to ASU after my parents had moved down to Phoenix. I was smart enough after two years of living through blizzards in northern Minnesota and coming to ASU to finally transfer here to ASU. And uh, I can tell you, when I came to ASU, and I hope that each of you find this as well, because when I came to ASU, I found a professor by the name of Professor Richard Smith. He was the professor that turned me on to industrial engineering at ASU. And it was, the, it was that first meeting with uh, Professor Smith that really made me realize that ASU was going to be my foundation for really all that I was going to do as a future leader at whatever company I was going to choose after graduation. Um, you know, a lot of times when you're, when you're a freshman, there are quite a few freshmen in this uh, audience tonight, when you get here, it's difficult. This is a big place, it's a, especially now. I graduated from ASU, I'll tell you, 31 years ago. Yes, 31 years ago. So it's changed quite a bit, but it was still, at that time, it was still a 35,000 student um, campus where I was just a part of a pretty small engineering college at the time. I think, Ganesh, we figured it was about seven or 8,000 at the time. Now it's 21,000 here at the ASU Engineering College um, to be really, truly the largest engineering school in the country. So just a little advice for those of you that are just starting, because you just started about, when did you actually start classes? August 17th? So you've been here just for a couple weeks. You're just now getting into your class schedules and all the routines that you have to get into. Um, but you really have to find your way. You have to find that foundation and find that foundation within your engineering discipline here at ASU. This school can be... It's, it's too massive to think that you can conquer all the things, all ASU. But that's what happened with me. So it happened, I was able to find that professor who brought me into the industrial engineering program. I was studying international politics at this northern Minnesota school. But I knew that I liked math, I enjoyed business, and I wanted to be more than just an engineer. I wanted to do other things too. And he was able to really lead me down this path within the industrial engineering program. I see there's a few IE folks up here, but because uh, um, what I quickly realized about the other engineering disciplines, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm always going to, I always tell the truth, I enjoyed thermodynamics so much that I took it twice. <clears throat> so, you know the reason why I had to take it twice, right? Because I didn't do so well that first time with my thermodynamics class. But you know what? That was a life lesson. When I went home to, to my father at that point and, and showed him my grades, that I didn't quite do well in thermodynamics, but I did okay the second time. But it did teach me, those were all teaching moments, it taught me that you know, that wasn't going to be, I was never going to be a chemical engineer um, as a discipline. Is it okay? Am I okay? <laughs> this is exciting. Come back to ASU and there's a storm. Who would have thought? It's just a dust storm, just a dust storm. But I think, I mean, as you, as you start thinking about your journey, you're going to have those things happen to you as you go through your different curriculums that you have here at ASU. And I had those same journeys here at, at uh, ASU that I went through. But what I quickly realized 
as I started taking more of my core classes, I really believed in the foundation that I was getting here at ASU. So when I talk to students today, I like to talk to students because I actually am one of the very few people, 25% of most students use their degree to the level that I use my degree. I use my degree at UPS because as soon as I graduated from ASU, I went directly to UPS. As Ganesh said, I was interviewed. Well, just think about it. How many seniors are there in this room? Okay, there's a couple of you. So you're getting ready to interview this year. You're going to start thinking about that job, thinking about the career, right? Well, I was doing the same thing. So I was interviewing with companies, and my buddy that did an internship program with UPS said, hey, I think UPS might be hiring industrial engineers. So I said, all right, well, I'll go try it. So I somehow got an interview. I actually was offered a job, except the one caveat that the guy said uh, that I interviewed with. He said, there's just one small piece that you might not know yet, but before you become an engineer at UPS, you have to be a driver. You have to deliver the packages. You have to drive the brown truck. So think about it. Everybody in this room, you think about it, right? You're going to college, you're, you're, you're getting your engineering degree, and the next thing you know, you're behind the wheel of a brown truck. And I'm delivering packages on Christmas Eve in some small neighborhood here in Phoenix, going, I went to college to deliver packages in the big brown truck. But you know what? I will never, ever forget that experience. And why? Why do you think that is? Guess what? At UPS, we deliver and we pick up packages. Again, I said, it seems very simple, but trust me, it's, uh, I was quite a bit skinnier then when I was a driver at UPS too. It's a physical job, but it taught me, again, the foundation. Just like I had the foundation of many classes here at ASU, I had the foundation at UPS where I started really at the ground level as a driver. So then after I was successful as a driver, Damon, I was a good driver at UPS. You can check my records if you want. I have a couple of my UPS partners back in the corner back here. Um, then I was able to go into the industrial engineering department. And I quickly realized that even within the industrial engineering program at UPS, I actually used the classes that I took here at ASU. So what do you think of my first industrial engineering job at UPS? I was a time study observer. Think about that. What do you think a time study observer at UPS does? So we measured driver steps. We measured all their delays. I did that for two and a half years at UPS, just to get to know methods, procedures, and measurement. We measure everything at UPS. So the planned time that it should take to deliver 140 packages in this area here at ASU or versus Sierra Vista in southeastern Arizona, that's what we do. We measure everything at UPS, which was part of this foundation that I got here at ASU that I could easily apply to my job at UPS. And that continued. You know, the different jobs and rotations then that I had you know, I've been with UPS 31 years, and I've had the fortunate opportunity to work 10 different positions and 10 in many different locations all over the world. And applying my engineering skills, not just IE skills, my engineering skills, my leadership skills, my communication skills, all of those apply no matter what engineering discipline you have. You have to be able to do those things. You have to be able to communicate with people. You have to be able to be a leader within your groups so that you can actually continue to move up with an organization um, to continue your career. So a lot of people ask me the question, well, how can you work at one company for 31 years? I mean, you just, you know, of course, my kids ask that same question. I, you know, my kids are in their late 20s. Dad, I'll never work for a company that long. Well, I always tell them. I've had different positions every three years at UPS. It's like starting at a new company, a new position, 
a new opportunity. I had the fortunate opportunity to travel the globe for seven years, start up businesses in China, start up businesses in, in Europe, go to different places in South Africa to start up new operations. In the Middle East now we've started, I, I can honestly say I have had the fortunate opportunity to travel and visit every continent, every location um, that our company, I haven't been to all 220 countries, but to our main countries all over this world. That as an engineer at UPS, and to be able to help apply leadership skills and engineering skills to different people within different countries across this great uh, company. So again, I'm gonna keep coming back to the foundation that everybody's getting here, the foundation that I actually had as I started with UPS, working not just in IE, but in operations, managing people, working nights, working mornings. I, I told Ganesh, I've never had a nine to five job. That would be the other challenge. Not all jobs are nine to five jobs. Um, some jobs are, but not all jobs. And I think that's uh, one of the other kind of important learnings that was a part of my foundation. As a driver at UPS, that was not a, it's not a nine to five job to be a driver at UPS, let me tell you. Um, that's a tough job. But all, all those experiences, that's all part of developing your foundation so you can continue to find the direction that you want to take in your engineering discipline um, and where you want to go with your career, no matter what company it is. I'm going to keep coming back to this little, my little advertisement tonight too. UPS is hiring engineers for sure. Okay, I just want to make sure that's very clear. We are hiring engineers for sure. Now is the time. We are developing and building the global smart logistics network at UPS. And we're hiring. And we're hiring all different types of engineering disciplines. I can tell you, I was out with our partners today. Goodyear, Arizona. Anybody know where Goodyear is out west on I-10 out there? We're building, we have a 900,000 square foot facility. Um, it's going to be our largest facility in the state of Arizona. Um, technology driven with automation, robotics, data, and it's a data driven building. So computer science, information technology, um, all the latest in terms of automation equipment uh, will be a part of that facility. So I know Damon is looking for mechanical, electrical, computer science, industrial, all of that right here in Arizona but we're doing that all over the world. So it's my little plug, just to make sure that I get that plug in for uh, the entire group here tonight too. Now, I have to admit, I have one personal story that I just want to at least share with the group too. Um, my daughter just graduated from ASU. She's a online ASU graduate, so I'm so proud of her. So I went to the other bookstore today to buy her some um, souvenirs from ASU today. But um, she got a great education, um, psychology and biology degree. She did extremely well. Um, but I have, to, I have to be honest, she now is going to the University of Arizona to get her master's degree. So it's unfortunate. I had to make sure that I came full. You know, I was full disclosure tonight with you. She is an ASU Sun Devil, but she is going to the University of Arizona to finish her master's degree now too, so that was one um, other piece to uh, uh, my personal side with my daughter, at least being another Sun Devil in our family. Um, so that's uh, important. So one thing I wanted to describe to the group too with, you know, what is engineering at UPS? I mean, it, I talked about a little bit with this new building, um, but if you can imagine the global supply chain and imagine the first iPad launch, does anybody remember the first iPad launch? What, what year that, that was? Come on, you're not that young. Are you? Really? What year was the first iPad launch? The iPhone was in 07, and the first iPad was in 09. Okay. So I was in charge of international engineering at the time. UPS was awarded through Apple to launch the first iPad 
from southern China. So the manufacturing is done by Foxconn in Shenzhen, China. And that was my job to make sure that we moved all of the iPads, all the information from Shenzhen, China to all the distribution facilities here in the U.S. to be delivered on a very specific Friday morning by 1030. Okay? Yeah, that was my job. So I'm standing on the docks of this ex incredible warehouse in Shenzhen, China, where they manufacture the iPad. I mean, I got to tour the iPad factory with, you know, they have 200,000 people at that location. Um, needless to say, we weren't always in sync between Foxconn, the manufacturer, Apple, and UPS. The first iPad launch was not a great success. Unfortunately, it was, it was not, let's just say that at the time, Steve Jobs sent my CEO um, not very nice emails. And you can imagine, I was the guy standing in southern China when that email was sent to my CEO. Um, I spent about five hours back in the corporate office to try and explain what happened and why this thing, why it went the way that it, you know, it went. It wasn't just UPS's problem, it was just the first launch of something that large. Apple didn't understand the demand that they had. They had manufacturing problems, they had data problems. We didn't understand how many they were going to ship, but if you think about a, a, a supply chain, that was the supply, ch the global supply chain at its peak. And we learned a tremendous amount from that event. So I'm, I'm here to tell you, this is another one of those foundational life lessons. You always learn from your mistakes, right? People make mistakes. You make mistakes in business too just like we did that day. But guess what? Steve Jobs decided to give us the next Apple launch. Trust me, it was painful to make sure that it was right, but we did it. And the next launches have all gone extremely well. And we are we're very proud of the fact our relationship with Apple uh, continues to grow and, and shine. But it's just another one of those, you know, when you think about just getting a package delivered to your doorstep. Um, you know, it's just not about um, the driver bringing it to you. It's also about the overall global supply chain. So that was just one example. <clears throat> a second example, how many people in this room might shop online? Okay. Do you buy almost everything online? Most of you do now, right? So, I, what company do you generally order from? I was just guessing that that might be the answer. So I had the, I had the fortunate ability, I was, I, was, I was actually in Seattle about a month ago, and I actually got to meet and listen to Jeff Bezos. Um, and w Amazon is one of, our, one of our largest customers at UPS, you can imagine. Um, but I'm telling you, when you really think about, again, the global supply chain, and what Amazon is doing to disrupt retail space across this globe, and what they're doing with e-commerce, what they're doing with uh, innovation and technology and data and marketing, it's incredible. So that's another example of what we're doing with Amazon to really help deliver this global smart logistics network. Because what do you expect? If you order all your toothpaste on Amazon, when do you expect it? When do you expect it to get delivered? Yeah, you got to have it the next day, right? You got to have it the next day. So, do you think there's logistics involved in that event to really try and get your toothpaste delivered to you, so you have it the next day? So the the integrated networks that really happen within the supply chain now, it's pretty incredible. And I think, you know, one thing Jeff said that uh, I, I always find interesting is, and you're going to be a part of this. I mean, it's pretty exciting that you're, you're a part of this, this journey now that's going to be uh, um, a part of your careers and a part of your future is the next generation of innovation. 
So, and Jeff said this too, he said, they benefited greatly. What do you think Amazon benefited more from than any other company? What do you think? What was the one piece of technology that Amazon benefited more from than anybody? The phone, the iPhone, Samsung, right? Do you order on your, on your iPhones and your Samsung devices? And Jeff's, that was a tailwind for his business, that his business was able to leverage that technology that took off. So everybody in here, I know you all do, you order everything on your phone or your iPad, but most of you just use your phones, right? So now think about fast forward. Some of you are shaking your head, no, you don't use Amazon, that's okay. You use it on your laptop, are you a computer science major? No, okay. <laughs> um, but think about now the future. So this is where UPS, what do you think would benefit UPS and give UPS a tailwind in the future? Self-driving cars, right? Very good. Autonomous vehicles, do you think that'll be a good benefit for UPS? You know that that's going to be significant for us. What else? Robotics, drones, computer vision, right? All that is part of the uh, robotic needs that we have too with computer visioning. AI, the artificial intelligence that drives that behind. So, so you today, sitting here as engineering students, I'm telling you, the next five to 10 years it is so exciting to think about what you're going to be a part of. I mean, I look back at when I was a driver at UPS, I used paper delivery records. I had a pen, a, pa a piece of paper that had 50 lines on it to write 50 packages, a piece of carbon paper, so I could file the delivery records. That was 31 years ago. But even think, 10 years ago, the iPhone was invented in 07, right? Think what's changed in the last 10 years, but now what's going to happen in the next 10 years. It really is remarkable. And schools like ASU, and I'm very biased, I'm very biased, I expect big things from students like you. I expect really big things from students like you here at ASU. I, I couldn't be prouder to be an ASU graduate and to be running the engineering group at UPS for me. Um, it, it is a privilege and an honor for me to be in this position and to know that my foundation was set here at ASU, that I developed those skills at ASU in this engineering program here and was able to continue to move through this organization and work for a great company like UPS. Um, so it's, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's a great pleasure. I've, couldn't be more pleased to be a part of the event tonight. Um, I really want to open it up to questions um, from the group. Remember what I said at the beginning, right? If you don't ask me questions, I get to ask you questions. Um, but um, how many people actually attended the first football game here? Okay. So all I'll just say is you just have to really beat the pants off the San Diego. Is it San Diego State this weekend? Okay, so just make sure you have, we, we at least can go 2-0 and this weekend. I think that's pretty important that uh, you start with a 2-0 and season this year. So I, uh, I miss my ASU football games too, but I still do follow the mighty Sun Devils. So. Okay, so Ganesh, I will turn the floor to you. I'm going to turn my, okay. We have microphones. We will be on either end of the room. Margo will be here and I will be on the other side. We will bring the phone, uh, microphones to you so you can ask questions. What kinds of things would you like to know about, ooh, nice. Wow. Love it when people raise their hands. Okay, let's have Margot go first, and then, thank you. You spoke earlier that you were part of the sustainability, uh, global sa sustainability. Would you mind speaking a little more about what you do for UPS in that realm? I, certainly, that would be a pleasure. Um, so I, I will say that UPS is really a leader in the transportation industry. Uh, from a sustainability standpoint. Um, 
we have been over the last five years, actually ye yesterday was a, we had a press release. Um, another award was given to us just for some of the works that we're doing with sustainability. We have taken, and, and if you think about our company, you know, we have a fleet here in the U.S. of about 100,000 vehicles that are on the street every day. So a couple things are very important. One is the miles that we drive. So one of the areas that we've been focused on has been the miles that our drivers drive. We implemented a technology about four years ago called Orion. It's really an optimization uh, program that optimizes a driver's day. So if you think about a typical driver delivers 140 deliveries and maybe makes 20 pickups every day. And everywhere around the country, every area, um, Phoenix, we dispatch 300 drivers out of the Phoenix building, I think, Damon, 250, something like that. Um, optimizing a driver's day from a miles perspective to make sure that packages are serviced on time, um, they get picked up when they need to, uh, they handle any special circumstances or uh, customer requests. So we have an algorithm, we have a very large operations research group at UPS that's developed the algorithms to help optimize the driver's day. So through that effort, we've actually saved six to eight miles per driver per day over the last four years. So just some quick math, just so you kind of understand the size and scale of that is, you know, one mile saved at UPS per driver per day is worth $50 million a year. It saves 100,000 cubic tons um, of carbon. So the numbers are just, they get just massive when it, uh, uh, when you start optimizing drivers' miles. So we're pretty proud of that, uh, that effort uh, from our um, OR team that's a part of our industrial engineering group and uh, the Orion program is one. Second area is now alternative fuel vehicles. So the big piece, the big uh, technology that we're, so we're doing a lot of different uh, types of technology, but LNG and CNG fleets, uh, we've been investing uh, significantly with our LNG and CNG fleets across the U.S. We have about 9,000 of those vehicles on the street every day now. Um, and that, so we've driven about 1.6 billion miles on alternative fuel vehicles between electric, um, LNG, CNG, hydraulic. So we're doing a lot with the vehicle type of fuel to lower our carbon as well. And that's, uh, we hit the billion miles last, mid last, uh, in 16, we're about a billion six that we're driving now across the country. So. We're doing so much to uh, come out, and I will tell you this, and I'm not here to do any political speeches, um, <clears throat> but we are, so, does anybody know about COP21? What, what uh, happened in Paris with the, uh, in, in Paris last year? So, you know, we, we've come out with some pretty strong sustainability targets to really actually reduce our carbon footprint, um, to increase the number of vehicles that are alternative or electric, um, and really to make an impact for the environment, which many companies today, they don't, it, the government might not be behind it 100%, but we've come out very strong with our sustainability targets at UPS, and that's gonna be, we're gonna continue to talk more and more. I'm speaking at the Green Biz Conference in two weeks out in um, San Francisco, that uh, we're very active with that as well. So I have a lot of uh, environmental engineers uh, solar's the other one. We're going to put solar panels up, Damon, right? Solar panels up, Damon, on our new Goodyear building. So we're doing a lot more with solar energy now, too. That's a, that's a growing area for us on our facilities, and we're very excited about uh, the use of solar. So we're very active with, uh, with all things um, sustainable. The tough one for everybody within the transportation industry is the airline. Airline's difficult because you don't have any alternative fuels yet for air, for jets. Um, but we work hand in hand with Boeing and with Airbus uh, to help uh, look at some alternatives with that too. Great question, thank you. This is a good thing, how are you gonna get So you were talking earlier, yes. on, yes, can you hear me? Cool, okay. So you were talking earlier about um, having to start as a driver. 
is that so that later on, in because now that you're at a much higher position, is it so that you already know what the drivers need to be more efficient, so that when you're later up in the chain, it can be done great, easier? Great question. So there's, I, I think there's several different reasons why we want our people to have the experience. One is you want to be able to understand the job. It's, it's the most important job at UPS. Um, so there's methods and procedures, understanding the vehicle, because if you think about it, even the vehicle itself and the design of the vehicle is important for us to be as efficient as possible, right? We have a 20-inch selection area in the bulkhead on the top shelf where we ask our drivers to move their packages up into the 20-inch selection area so that you minimize the number of reaches and grass that you have to go back in the back of the package car. All of those are part of the methods and procedures that we have. And we want people to understand that. The other piece to it, though, I think that's even more important is the interaction with customers. As you think about the UPS driver, does, everybody, does anybody in here know your UPS driver? Come on, don't be bashful. He loves their UPS drivers. Most of our UPS drivers are, when you look at all the surveys we do from a customer standpoint, our UPS drivers are very popular with our customers. They really take it very seriously. I'll tell you a story right now. Houston, Texas. Right? Houston, Texas, tragedy. I hope none of you are from Houston or have family, but it's been just a horrific story. And we have Irma coming up. The recovery efforts, the next day after the hurricane, who wanted to come to work right away? The drivers. And you know why the drivers? They believe they are a part of the community and they wanted to come back to help the recovery efforts. It was incredible. I mean, it was incredible. They had problems at home, but they wanted to come back because they knew their customers, they knew their communities were impacted so much by the hurricane and the floods that they wanted to be put back and a part of that. So that other interaction, that to me is another very important part of being a driver at UPS, understanding the interaction with the customer and really it, it, it helps teach you know, what we do to really value our customers at UPS. So it does, again, the foundation, that's what I keep kind of talking about, the foundation that you're getting tonight here at school and then the foundation you get at, at your job when you start. So let's just say that you're going to get a job at uh, a manufacturing plant. I think it's very appropriate you work on the floor actually performing the job so you understand what the job is, right? I think that's very appropriate. And I will tell you this, this is what I love about ASU. There are some universities, when we recruit, there are some universities and some students that say, I, I can't lower myself to be a driver at UPS. That doesn't happen here at ASU. ASU is a special place. You folks are a part of a special program, and that's why you know, I'm proud to be an ASU graduate. And that's uh, exactly why being a driver is extremely important. I have a follow-up question for that. Yeah, um, sure. With automation coming in, that's what you guys are working towards. Won't you lose all of that? It's a very good question, too. <laughs> Those are my only tools for automation. No. So we employ 440,000 people at UPS today in 220 countries. Um, and if you think about one of, the, one of the challenges today is to continually find people to work. And none of you are going to ever just be an unloader to unload packages out of trailers every day. Most people don't want to aspire to do that for a living. So a lot of the jobs, when we hire people in those positions today, again, we're hiring for those jobs too, right, Damon? If you want to come and unload packages, we have plenty of those jobs too. But we hire mainly college students because we want turnover. We want people to not, it's not a career to unload packages. So in the part-time jobs inside our hubs, those are the jobs that will become more automated with technology. It's many, many years down the road before you're not going to see a UPS driver out there delivering packages. Would there maybe be drones on the top of the package car to deliver out into rural areas, which we've tested? Um, absolutely. That's going to become a part of it. But that's where I need smart engineers like you folks in this room to help us figure all that out, right? But uh, you know, we're always going to need people and, uh, in different positions. Engineering jobs are going to become much more important at UPS 
in the future than they were 30 years ago. So your skills that you're developing here are going to become more important for UPS. They are right now. We're hiring more engineers now than we ever have. And uh, so that's the skill set that we're looking for. Good questions. <laughs> Show of hands, please, so we can find where everybody is. Okay, let's do the first row and then we'll So uh, I want to ask, like, uh, I read about the sustainable program which you have in your website by 2022, you know, completely turn all the vehicles. Good. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Yeah. And uh, I want to ask you, how was the transition for you? What was the effect of the transition from the normal vehicles to the more uh, eco-friendly vehicles? So how it affected the efficiency, how it affected the cost of the supply chain? All right, so I'll give you the. I have a few more questions too. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do you want to? Do you want to just? Can I? I'm not. Okay. This when is you get first... old like I am, I can't remember questions. Okay. This is my like... first question. Uh, my second question is, um, uh, I also read that uh, you're partnering with uh, the Expo 2020. Yes. Uh, so, what new we can expect from UPS as a uh, partnership? Uh, Done a little research. <laughs> Good man. Okay. Two more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I mean. Okay. Uh, the third question is: me, uh, I also read that uh, you uh, have this, uh, you know, expansion in the South Asian countries, Correct. Uh, like India, for example. Yes. So, what are the next plans you uh, you have to expand UPS's operations in uh, South Asian countries? That is my third question. And fourth question is: <laughs> uh, You guys have, uh, you know, acquired certain uh, other. Uh, you know, logistic companies in certain uh, European countries. Mm -hmm. How do you regulate your principles to such companies when you acquire them? Like not. Uh, How do you what? Like the, you have certain mer mergers with uh, certain logistic companies in the European countries. Yes, we do. So how do you like regulate your standards to them? Like uh, they. They don't like it. Huh? They don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So these are okay. my four questions. Those are good questions. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back to the first question. Your first question was about sustainability, how we've kind of transitioned to that. So I'm going to give you one that's my favorite line to always tell people. What's the greenest mile? I'm asking you that question. What's the greenest mile? The greenest mile is the mile not driven. Right? So if you think about that, if I described our Orion project, so the greenest mile is the mile not driven. We've been saving six to eight miles that our drivers don't drive. Those are the greenest miles at UPS. So for me, Mr. Efficiency and Mr. Sustainability, it really is about efficiency that leads to a much more sustainable environment for us. And when you really think about that, and, and so, so we reflected quite a bit, because it's, it's been a journey for us. I mean, it has been a journey. But when you started really realizing that the best thing we can do is reduce miles. It's the best thing we can do. So we're going to continue down that path. Working to do things with innovation and technology and other types of vehicles, and all of that's important too. Don't get me wrong. We're doing that. But we're always trying to optimize. So let me give you one other example. We bought a company called Coyote Logistics. Anybody know where they're from? Coyote's based out of Chicago, Illinois. They're a great company. They have no assets. They just have technology. They essentially do procurement of over-the-road tractor-trailer drivers to move goods for grocery businesses, Anheuser-Busch. So we, we acquired this company because they have, they have the technology to communicate across the network. But what they also do is now they actually fill our miles that are currently backhaul. So when I mean backhaul, so when Damon sends a trailer from Phoenix, Arizona with packages that may go to Dallas, Texas, well, if that driver then comes back from Dallas, Texas without packages, he needs something in that. So we're using Coyote to fill, not with packages, but we're also filling it with water or with beer or with um, other grocery goods. That's also, again, it's a greener mile because it's not an empty mile. 
So there are different ways to look at this, and that's another example of uh, what we're doing to UPS. Okay, so your second question. Can you help me out? Your second question. Expo 2020. We're very excited about that. So I'm going to tie that in with your third question. So we know we're in 220 countries right now around the world. We know there are different markets that are really expanding. So we've formed a district out of, based out of Dubai. And Dubai is really our new Middle East, Africa, and India is that district. And that's the basis of that district. So we've invested now in that area. So we form these partnerships um, to actually sponsor Expo 2020. And you know, I don't know if you know, but it just seems that for whatever reason, there are some countries in the Middle East, money really just doesn't matter to some people for whatever reason. It just doesn't. So there's going to be some fantastic technology. I honestly believe part of Expo 2020 for us we're going to be able to do some pretty unique things. I think autonomous vehicles will be a part of what they want to show. Sustainability. So my sustain chief sustainability officer, she's engaged now with the different local agencies and government agencies because they want it to be the greenest show ever. And we're going to be a part of that. So I'm pretty excited about that because that's, that's, uh, that, that'll help UPS become also much more present um, in the Middle East. So, we're pretty excited about the Middle East. We're also always looking at companies to purchase. This leads into your other question. We're always looking for companies in these large, in these large populated areas. India is always, you know, we're in India today, but we're not as big as we need to be. So we're always looking for opportunities in a place like India. We have a four corner strategy in Africa that uh, we're investing in companies in the four corners of Africa um, to help grow business in Africa. And that's uh, also very exciting. And for me, it's, you know, I love this because I've traveled to all these places. I know our people in all these places, and it's, it's fun for me to see some of our folks grow. Engineers included, by the way. So we have jobs for engineers in all these countries. We have needs in all these places. This isn't just a jobs here in Phoenix, Arizona. There are jobs in Dubai. There are jobs in Riyadh. There are jobs down in Joburg. There are jobs in Mumbai. There are jobs all over that we needed good engineers. So I always say, this isn't just about Phoenix, sorry, Damon, but <coughs> he's here to recruit for Phoenix, but I'm here to recruit really for the globe. Um, and we have, so, we're, so that purchase of other companies is, is part of our strategy over the years. In Europe, we've purchased quite a few. So I was a part of two purchases that we did in, in Europe. One was Stolicza, which was a Polish company that we purchased in Poland. And then we bought Lynx which is a, a company out of the UK. So when we purchase a company, and we'll just use Stolicza. Stolicza was a company that uh, they were the largest ground delivery business in Poland. We were very small. We bought them. Now we were very big. Um, but the good news is, guess what? We came in with our UPS uh, brown vehicles, our dyads, our technology that our drivers handle. And now today, Poland is brown UPS with the same procedures and methods and packages and visibility that we have here in the US. Same thing in the UK. Lynx, they became brown. I'm making it sound awfully easy. There were some very difficult days <laughs> um, to get through that, but it, uh, it's worked out very well for us. So, you know, it's part of a company's ability to integrate, you know, acquired companies because generally it always works, you know, the company that purchases is the company that's going to run the business. It generally doesn't work where you just let them do their thing. That doesn't work that way. So I've learned that kind of the hard way over the years, too. So great. Did I answer all the questions? Wow, that was hard. That was like a test. I was four. I, sorry, that was really, I mean, this is late at night. Now, remember, in, in Atlanta, it's 10 o'clock now. So I'm on, I'm on 10 o'clock PM Eastern time all right now. So very good questions. OK, thank you. Uh, okay. All right. Um, sorry, I don't have. As extensive, maybe you or could ask six long, questions. You know, questions as the last one, <laughs> or enough research to, to back it up like that. Um, I, I I heard a little bit about what you said about the um, beginnings you had in undergraduate school and how you began you know driving a UPS truck and I you know very humble beginnings and things like that. 
Um, so I actually kind of have a simple question for you. As an undergraduate myself, beginning engineers and everything, how can beginning engineers prepare or get involved to try and change the world on an international scale or get ready to you know, be the next um, fosterers of the problems that we have in the world? Pretty deep question. Um, honestly, you know, when I look back and I, and I reflect on my, my own journey, right, and my own foundation, I was pretty fortunate. I, like I told you, I studied international politics for two years. So I actually studied overseas, and I was, you know, like you, I had no money, I was poor, I, I don't know how I lived. I remember I have a picture, not a digital picture, just a picture of me standing in the red square with one dollar. That's all I had left in my pocket. I had no money, and I didn't know how to get home. But all those are life lessons, because you learn some of the troubles in the world, too. And I've traveled to the Middle East as a young kid. I got... So I had an opportunity to do those things. Those were all part of my foundational upbringing that I got the ability to travel globally. But then I realized that how was I going to really change things? And I got into UPS. And of course, initially when I was working for UPS, I didn't really have a scope of international. But it did quickly become part of my interest to figure out how can I really change UPS around the globe. And, but it, 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 it does still go back to what I really learned as I was coming up through college and coming up through here and some of the principles and some of the, you know, my professors I had here were just fantastic. I had, and I, I, believe it or not, I Googled them this morning and I had a list of all my professors that I had. You, I, can, I you can Google anything, right? So 1986 professors at ASU IE. <clears throat> They're still there. I found them. And uh, it, it was fun to just kind of reflect. But for you, solving the world's problems, you know, it's, it's a big scope. I think the biggest thing that you can really think about is what type of technology is going to be the next big thing. Technology is going to continue to transform this world. So, you know, we've mentioned drones, we've mentioned um, robotics, we've mentioned artificial intelligence. You know, we do so much with data mining and, and all of that now that, you know, if you don't understand how to, how to manipulate and understand and, and look at a data set, you're going to have a tough time if you don't understand that. But to be able to take that and think forward what and how could it change something? You have to figure out how to solve that. So, you know, in my mind, remember I, I failed thermodynamics. I wasn't very good in it. So I knew that I wasn't going to solve thermodynamic problems for the world. But I did figure out pretty quickly that I had a mind for business, but I also had a mind for math and other engineering courses that I really enjoyed. And so I think that's the biggest thing. You've got to find your passion and then look at the Look forward to those next big things that are really on the horizon. And today you have so much at your fingertips that you can kind of pick, but can't pick it all. But, but use what you're good at and use your passion to really think about where that future is going to take you. That would be my own advice. Good question. Thank you. <clears throat> really some good questions tonight. I, I appreciate this. <clears throat> um, does this work? Yeah, you got it. Okay. Um, so I'm a computer science major, okay, right? Good. So <laughs> I don't have a laptop on me. Um, so I was wondering what kind of technologies and what kind of work do computer science engineers do at UPS? So I was, I was describing actually to the faculty at dinner. So one of the things that's happened at UPS, we've actually brought the IT organization and the engineering organization together at UPS. So it's a change. A lot of times, honestly, we, the IT group was here and the engineering group was here and we, we didn't really, we didn't play well in the sandbox together. So now we're actually together. So Juan Perez, who's the CIO, myself, Juan happens to have engineering, Damon, you know Juan, he's, he has engineering experience at UPS, but he also has been in the IT organization as a computer science degree that he, of course, he's a USC graduate. Ugh. So he and I kind of have this thing. 
but we're together. And why is that important? Because as, I keep, as I've talked about this global smart logistics network, there's only one thing that drives it all. What do you think that is? Data. And the data is driven by computer scientists. The data is driven by those that can help us bring that data together in a way that can truly bring that logistics network alive. Because all the technology, even robotics, any of that, it's all about the software behind it that makes it happen, right? So we're looking for, we just opened a new IT center in, in uh, Parsippany, New Jersey. It's fantastic, it's beautiful. And we are, it is, we are always looking to hire. I think Juan had 210 interns last summer. I had 140 interns uh, in the engineering group. So, you know, that's the other piece. I'll, I'll put a plea out to the group here too. Damon hires locally, but it's not just locally. If you're going back home, uh, we hire interns all over the world um, for the summer internships too. It's another great way for you to enter a company to see what is it that companies like. And I have some friends that, uh, you know, some young students too that I just have known over the years that I got them some internships at, uh, within the IT group this summer. And, it was fantastic. They had a great experience. Um, so, correct. You could drive the big brown truck. Everybody wants, and you can even today though you can you can wear shorts now, driving the big brown truck. When I was a driver, no shorts, only pants here in Phoenix. So we've changed. We're mo we're more modern now. We're much more forgiving. <laughs> <laughs> right, Damon? I mean, we're much easier to work for now. Okay. Um, so taking a step away from all the engineering and whatnot, more to your personal life, I'm assuming you're a pretty busy man. How do you manage your personal life and your business life at the same time, especially with all the traveling you have to do? Like, how do you have to go back to your family and do things like that? It's a great question. It's a hard question. I should, I wish my wife was here with me. Maybe she could answer that question. Because I've had a very supportive, Naomi's been very supportive. Um, so we've moved all over the country. I've traveled all over the world. Um, and I always do give the advice. I always, uh, so um, I just put a new person in charge of international engineering that took my job that I had many years ago for seven years. And he has four children at home still. And so I sat Frank down and I said, Frank, let me just tell you one thing. There's only one piece of advice I'm going to give you. You must take time off to be home. You must schedule your time so you're home for some of the events. Because when you travel internationally, you're traveling on weekends and you're gone for weeks. So balancing that, that was the hardest. To travel with the job is the hardest part, um, to travel and balance that. And, you know, I, I've been very fortunate that uh, I have a supportive wife and my two kids were, uh, um, I had made it a priority to be a part of whatever I could. So I coached my, when I could, I coached my son's um, basketball team. I coached my daughter's basketball team. Not always very well because my wife was a much better coach at basketball than I was. So she was the head coach, I was the assistant coach. It just it worked out okay that way. But I will tell you, that's that's a hard part of balancing. And you know, the other two UPSers that are here in the room tonight, it's uh, it isn't easy. But like with anything, you kind of set your foundation. So when you first get a job, you all have to set your priorities and set that foundation. So. My bosses have always known that there are going to be times where I have to leave. And I don't care if you look at me funny if I leave at 2 o'clock because I have to do something. Um, I'm working at 2 in the morning possibly the next night, but that's what I did. So you shift and you balance, um, but you have to always make it a priority. And, uh, you know, my kids, uh, you know, they were troopers as well. We moved around the country, and that's always hard when you do that. I don't know how many people in this room is I've moved a lot, but it's not easy. It's not easy to move. Um, but again, it's got to be part of your foundation. It's got to be part of who you are, so you prioritize it. And, uh, and I also think, to be honest, I look at others. Now that I'm in my position, you know, when you, you know, I work for one person, but, but really I work, you know, all the engineers at UPS work for me. So I also look at young engineers coming up 
to make sure they can balance their life, because that's important. Especially, and I'll say this too, especially with many of the female engineers that I have now that are taking um, higher positions within UPS, it's really important to make sure that priority for family and personal time has to be. It just has to be. And so I, I just give you that advice too, that you know, the world, you need to have life. You're not just work. Um, I haven't always been good at that, but I have always maintained, you know, my family is, is the most important. So that's a, that's a great question. Good. Hi. So Hi. with regard to engineering disciplines and specializations, what do you see in the future as the ones that have the brightest outlook, the ones that will be most influential? What's your opinion regarding that? I mean, I honestly think that, uh, you know, today, to be in an engineering group like here at ASU, um, you know, whether, whether you're mechanical or aerospace, computer science, industrial, electrical, um, who am I missing tonight? Um, civil, I'm sorry, civils, biomedical. Because, and I'll just use biomedical as an example. One of the fastest growing sectors at UPS is our healthcare sector. We have an incredible supply chain group that has specialized engineers that deal with special operating plans to put, I mean, incredible surgical kits together along with fulfilling some of the medicines and doing that in a way that's just, it's unbelievable what's happening within the medical community. That's a huge growth area. Um, but when you, when you look at all engineering, at least from my perspective, I mean, we're building buildings, we're looking for new technology with robotics, with data analytics, with artificial intelligence, all of the things that come from an IT perspective and computer science, um, and the mechanical engineers too right now, and electrical. I mean, I look at the building that we're putting up today out in Goodyear, and I'm putting almost every major city we're putting a building in. And they're large. These are big, big buildings. And they are the electrical engineering skills that go behind those, the ability to use data to manage those buildings. I still think, remember I say the data-driven network? You have to have good data skills. You have to be able to understand what data is going to drive um, in the future. I think that's an important skill set for engineers of today. Um, but the core skills from civil and mechanical, um, you know, those, those skills are absolutely um, core skills right now, and especially the, with a little economic growth here in the U.S. is there's some great uh, opportunities there. So I don't think there's any one. I wouldn't, but I do think it's, you got to pick your area of focus within your own engineering discipline, but look out, don't look back, look out five years to think about what's coming. And you can research that, you can research that. But you know, for us, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, automation and robotics are pretty significant for UPS. That's gonna be a key driver along with the data side of that to, to drive the global smart logistics network. Hopefully you'll remember that because before you leave, you get a test tonight with all these questions. Because you asked me a test. <laughs> okay, one, one more? One more question. Um, I have two questions for two you. Two questions. Yes, I know you said one, but I have two. I can remember two. I, four I had a hard time with. Um, what was your favorite position that you've had at UPS and why? And then the second question is, if you want, if you wanted us to leave here remembering one thing tonight, what would it be? Okay, good question. My favorite job at UPS was to have his job. The gentleman there with the blue jacket. He, he is the district director of engineering for the Desert Mountain District here. You run four states, Damon, right? Um, and the reason that was my favorite job at UPS, because he got to do this, to interact and pick people 
to develop his department. So it, Damon's not doing the detailed work of what he used to do. Damon knows all the technology. I knew all the technology. I know the engineering, but it was selecting the right people and developing the people for advancement at UPS. That was, to me, the most rewarding. The job I have right now is great, don't get me wrong, but that is because you make such an impact with people like yourselves in this room that uh, I, I, I really truly found that that was my favorite position at UPS, to be in charge of a district department of engineering at UPS and to be able to develop people um, and watch people move up. I mean, that's by far the most rewarding um, that we have. <clears throat> so I'm going to go back to what I've been kind of saying all night. You're here to get your foundation. You're all here to get your foundation. You need to make sure that as you think about your foundation that you're building and developing, you have some vision on where you're going to take that next step from this foundation. It took me a while to figure it out, right? I made, I made mistakes. My first six months here at ASU, whew, coming from a small college, I, I struggled. I was having, a, I had a tough time. My GPA was not good the first six months, let me tell you. I struggled. But then I kind of figured things out. And I was able to kind of develop that foundation and really have a vision. And I, and I do think because of that foundation that I had, I chose UPS. And I had other job offers with other companies. But I, I knew that because of what I developed in my base and my foundation, UPS was the right place for me. And that's what, if you think about my history, what I've been able to do now at UPS, it had a lot to do with the foundation. And so I'd, I'd really, you know, I'm not trying to be so deep thought with all of you. I mean, you're a freshman in college. I mean, you're ready to go, I don't know, I guess this is a dry campus now that you can't drink here at ASU. I, someone told me that time. I, I don't remember that being a, the case when I was here at ASU that it was a dry campus, but it wasn't in where I went anyway. But, but I mean, you have a lot on your mind, but I think as you're, as, you're, as you're kind of working your way through your curriculum, your selections, and your area of emphasis, I think one thing now you do have a choice that you can have more of an area of emphasis within your engineering discipline that is going to become a part of your foundation so that you can pick that and think about where you want to take that from here at ASU. So it's a great question. I, I really enjoyed having the discussion with everybody tonight. Um, I hope you got something out of this tonight. We are hiring at UPS, did I tell you that? <laughs> did I tell you that? We're hiring at UPS, interns, co-ops, Engineering Development Program. They're engineering associates. When you graduate, you go right into a management position. Uh, don't worry. We like to have people drive the brown truck, too. Don't we, Dan? We still like to have people drive the brown truck. So uh, you'll, you'll hopefully get that opportunity, too. So uh, you've been great. These have been great questions. I, I, just, just like I said at the beginning, I'm proud to be an ASU Sun Devil. You all make me proud. So thank you. <laughs>